The papacy has been a source of controversy since the earliest days of Christianity. How does understanding the debates of the first millennium help our debates over the papacy today? That's going to be our topic today on Crisis Point. Hello, I'm Eric Sam, your host, and the editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before we get started, just want to encourage people to smash that like button, to subscribe to the podcast so uh, you know when we're having new ones come out and let other people know about it. Uh, also, we're on social media at all the major social media sites at Crisis Mag. Uh, also, I want to say we are ending our, we're at, right at the end of our, our twice a year uh, fundraising campaign. And so please donate to uh, Crisis. All our material is out there for free, but it's not free to produce. So if you just go to www.crisismagazine.com slash donate, and we would really appreciate it. We also appreciate even more your prayers. I get emails during these fundraising campaigns like, I can't give you money, but I'm going to pray Hail Mary for a rosary for me. I'm like, hey, man, that's worth any, more than anything you're going to give us. So we appreciate that, of course, as well. Okay, so let's get into it. Our guest today is returning guest, Eric Ibarra. He is the author of the new book right here in my hands. I can barely pick it up. The Papacy, Revisiting the Debate Between Catholics and Orthodox. Welcome to the program, Eric. Oh, thank you for having me back, uh, Eric. It's great to be here. Look forward to it. Yeah, I, I've been looking forward to this one for a while. I think I mentioned the book when you were on last time, which is, I think, might have been o even over a year ago. I can't even remember how long it's been, but uh, you were working on it then. And I will, I'm going to make a confession to everybody right now. I have not yet finished the book. However, <laughs> as you can see from my bookmark, I am on page 462. Wow. I, I just got this a few a couple weeks ago as well. So I feel like I've, I'm making good progress. I'm on the chapter on Gregory the Great right now, which is very important for me because I'm writing a book about Gregory the Great. I'm going to have a chapter in that book about his views of the papacy. So I'm just going to copy and paste your chapter. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll give you credit when I do it. So I don't mind that. Yeah, I, you'd have to take it up with. Uh... The St. Paul Center. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes, this is published uh, through Emmaus Road Publishing, St. Paul Center. Uh, they do great. They, they put out some great books, and this is another great one. So the book itself is, it's over 700 pages. So I think it's okay that I haven't quite finished it yet. But I, Yeah, I you're very it. far, man. That's uh, Everybody else that's reading it at a very fast pace, at least what I would thought was a fast pace, has not has not gotten as far as you. So that's pretty darn good. Hey, I'm I'm in the lead. For the <laughs> so, yeah, no, it, it really is. I mean, OK, I know this is going to sound weird to some people, but I feel like it's a page turner. I mean, it's the is type it? of thing that I just want to just I just I pick it up. I read it. I don't want to stop. And then when I do stop, I'm like, OK, I got to get back to it. So uh, that's it, it's a delight excellent. to hear. I thought it was going to be a complete um, just boring. Um, but that's that's such a delight to hear. Yeah. And, and, and that is a challenge with a book like this. It can be very boring. I mean, you really could write a book like this and it's this big snoozer because the topic you're getting, you get into the, the weeds of things at times and you're trying to get the big picture. You're covering a lot of material. You're, you're referencing lots of sources. You can get to a point where it's like, boy, you really could put somebody to sleep, but you don't, at least you didn't put me to sleep. So I'm still reading. <laughs> eh, that's a blessing. So the real crux of the book, if and correct me if I'm wrong here, is your it, your subtitle is revisiting the debate between the Catholics and Orthodox. But really, what you're doing is you are looking at the first millennium more than anything else, and you are saying, okay, how did first millennium Christians, both in the East and in the West, how did they perceive the the first? How did they perceive the papacy? So I guess my first question to you just is. Why is this important? Why should we care what the first millennium Christians thought about the papacy? Yeah, so, you know, it's good to underline that word in the title, revisiting, because um, it has been visited before, um, especially in, in the German and French languages. Um, if anybody knows French or German, um, and you live in Europe, for example, um, or now so, many, so much is available through archive.org, um, you'll notice that French theologians, German theologians, and um, uh, and even even in Spanish, in, in and, and obviously in Latin, um, the the subject of the primacy of of the Roman Pontiff has been debated between you know East and West for many centuries now, um, but in the English language, um, there 
there was a there was a bunch of volumes put out in like the 1800s, the very early 1900s. Um, but since then, there's only been like a handful that have really been written with with the precise objections of the of the Byzantines um, in mind from the first millennium. So I, I stand on the shoulders of of some pretty big giants. Uh, so you know, Father Aidan Nichols, uh, uh, Doctor James Lacudis, uh, and a number of of uh, theologians and 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 uh, scholars. Um, but I think the subject needed to be revisited because. Ever since the 80s, we've had some progress in ecumenical dialogue with the Orthodox. And where we seem to be hovering over when it comes to the issue of the primacy um, is not demanding anything more than what was clearly accepted by the Greeks in the first millennium. That seems to keep coming up. Um, Father Joseph Ratzinger, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, he uh, is famous for speaking in that language, and uh, ever since he wrote that, I think in the late 70s, uh, it's just been continually repeated and quoted. And so when I embarked upon this study, it was, it was pertinent for me to revisit the first millennium, because even though we're here in the year 2022, that, that seems to be where both um, Orthodox scholars and clergy and Catholic scholars and clergy um, are fixated on, on what what was the first millennium like? Was it was it um, was it more conciliar in the sense of the way that the East is talking about, or was it more papal conciliar, or was it just full blown out ultra papalistic? Um, and so that's why I I kept to the first uh, thousand years. Yeah, and that's a good point. I was going to mention Ratzinger's, uh, com which is pretty famous now. I think he wrote it in the 1970s or so, uh, where he talks about that when talking about reunion with the Orthodox, uh, one possibility is the idea that we simply don't require the Orthodox, the Easterns, to accept anything that wasn't accepted in the first millennium. And that's an interesting point of view. And actually, I wasn't going to ask this question, but I just thought of it. Do you think, though, that potentially has a danger of antiquarianism, that the fact is there is more history after? We'll do, go into first millennium here in a little bit, but a thousand years have happened since then. And, for example, in the debates on the liturgy, there's that debate about we're not trying to, you know, some people say go back to the liturgy of the early church. Others say, no, it's actually developed for a reason. Would you think there's a danger of some antiquarianism there that, that we're not supposed to go back to the first millennium? We're supposed to live in the third millennium. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, there, there is a small danger of that because uh, uh, even the Eastern Orthodox uh, today um, has recognized uh, a great amount of development in their own church government. Um, so, you know, the development of the patriarchs, you know, the five patriarchs, you know, they call it the Pentarchic, Pentarchic government that developed, you know, by the fifth, sixth centuries, um, that in, in and of itself was a development from second, third century uh, church government structures. Um, and, and inevitably today you've got 14 autocephalous heads or bodies, self-governing churches that make up uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. And um, the Moscow Patriarchate, for example, um, the coverage of the Moscow Patriarch is more than Rome ever dreamed of in the year 700. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just talking about uh, uh, geographic coverage, right. you know. Um, so even the Orthodox have to recognize that there's been some practical developments um, where they still stick to the canons but they've been interpreted for the time. So it, it's inevitable that even if we do look at the first millennium, we're going to be looking at um, substantial, uh, we're looking at substantial doctrine uh, in the DNA of, of what was accepted. Of course, it's going to have to cross the bridge to our day and age, and, right. and both sides recognize that. Right. 
Now, I'm going to ask you an impossible question, so please answer it. <laughs> and that is, how would you, how, if you had to give an elevator pitch to somebody of explaining how the first, how the early Christians, let's just say the first millennium, how did they understand the papacy? How could you, how would you explain it? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, today, scholars are less interested in what one subgroup held um, so today, if you get a scholarly answer, they're going to tell you everybody's perspective on the papacy. So um, in that case, the Gnostics didn't have a very high view. <laughs> right. um, the Arians or the uh, Nestorians, the Miaphysites, and obviously the iconoclasts, um, they obviously didn't have a very high view of the papacy, even though they were at one time or a good portion of time part of the valid baptized population. Um, but if we're talking about the main line, you know, the Latin churches, the Byzantine churches that were in communion, you know, pretty steadily for the first millennium, um, it's very clear that, uh, that the, the affairs of the church, um, were self that th there was local governments. So the church was extremely parochial in the sense that um, there was a large commitment to solve problems in, in, in church life, church affairs at the smallest strata level. So at the local level. Um, but when items that could not be resolved on a local level would be kicked up to a higher level, um, the church, the church from very early on shows itself, conscious of a hierarchical government um, and what seems to be clear from both the Latin and the Greek sources is that the hierarchy reaches an apex at the court of the Roman church and um, whether you hold that as a political foundation or uh, the apostolical Petrine foundation um, it, it, you know we could talk about those differences but Pretty much everybody knew that Rome was the first sea, which might be a surprise because Jerusalem might have been thought of as the, mo the most organic first sea. That's where Christ our Lord died. That's where the first apostolic council was held. I mean, there's plenty of reasons going for Jerusalem. And yet, for some reason, the geopolitical capital of the Roman Empire ends up being the prima sedis or the first sea. And, and so um, issues of doctrine, issues of discipline, um, anywhere from financial to scandal to uh, um, murder charges, what have you, if it could not be resolved on local and regional levels, they were kicked up in, through a, an appeal format. We call it an appellate structure. Um, just kind of like the way that Rome functioned in the in the secular world before it was Christianized, uh, you had metropolitans in all the provinces of Rome, and they ran an appellate structure that, you know, hit the apex with the Augustus Romana, the the the, the emperor and the senate. Um, in the same way, the church kind of folded the geopolitical format of the Roman Empire with the divine apostolic principle of the church. And, and so Rome kind of acted like that, like, like a final Senate for, for disciplinary and doctrinal matters. Um, and, and I think both East and West can recognize that. Um, so the issues of divergence are going to be um, more on the microscopic level or more on the, this, you know, the laboratory level, but a bird's eye view of your question, that's kind of how it was viewed. And the predominant rationale was that Christ had invested the apostles with governing authority, but he singled St. Peter out to have a very unique position, namely the head of the apostles. And that position uh, outlives Peter into his successors. Uh, which are stationed in the Roman bishopric. So the Roman pontiffs um, are heirs of the primacy given from Christ to St. Peter um, for this universal government. Okay, now, very good. I think the, the reason that question is a little bit unfair is because I think 
all honest observers would agree that the practice and even understanding of the papacy is different in the second century than it would have been in the 20th century, for example. And it's also true of the second century between the second century and the fifth century and the ninth century. So there is this development and there's this idea. And just like we have with our the understanding of the Trinity, understanding of the, the divine and human natures of Christ, things like that, that also developed. And I know the word development gets, especially some people in the East, the heebie-jeebies, uh, and yeah. even people, even, you know, some more traditional Catholics don't like that terminology either. It looks too much like evolution. But how would you then explain development and legitimate development when it comes to the papacy in the first millennium? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, <clears throat> it would have been nice if, you know, Jesus Christ, our Lord, gave like a, a specific manual how things had to be from the beginning to the end, uh, kind of like uh, the law of Moses was given in a very precise organized format um anytime there was a uh a, a, a backsliding period in israel they could just dust off the law and just follow the prescription from top to bottom and just replicate what was supposed to be um but that's not what we get in the new covenant um so what we get is primarily these church plants in different cities and what develops from there is the, you know, the metropolitan structure where a province of the Roman Empire would be now a, uh, a subset of the church's government where a metropolitan oversees bishops. So you've got bishops overseeing churches, then you've got metropolitans overseeing the bishops, and then you've got later on patriarchs overseeing metropolitans. That's not that was, that is not something that was original. Um, this whole idea of a patriarchate was a was definitely uh, an organic development that was built from prudence, built from canonical logic. It just seemed most appropriate to do these things. Um, so Rome definitely, you know, its patriarchal status. Is, is a development in and of itself because, you know, the Bishop of Rome oversaw the Church of Rome. Uh, but eventually we see Rome um, overseeing basically all of Italy at a certain point. You know, we see this as early as like the, the beginning of the fourth century at least. Um, so as the development goes forward, um, where we see new things come up is where you see unity being frustrated. So when the church starts to have ecumenical councils, for example, um, there's nowhere in the New Testament that says, well, you have to make sure that one of the legates of the Roman pontiff is there to ratify it. That's, that, that, that's nowhere in the New Testament. That's probably nowhere in the you know first and second, third century. But it became just a, a practical necessity like okay well if a church has a council in india or in jerusalem or nicaea or somewhere far in the east um we can't just pretend to establish decrees and push them out on the authority of the council um so despite the distance even though all those councils were held in the east the first seven ecumenical councils they were all held in the east and one of the points that some Eastern Orthodox like to bring out is that the Pope was actually never actually present at any of these councils. Um, and yet, when you see the official papers, the acts of these councils, um, there's this explicit recognition that, you know, his name or the name of his representatives have to be at the top. Um, his representatives have to review everything and give it sort of like a firm ratification. So the question is, why does this guy who is all the way in Rome, in Italy, why is he occupying such a, uh, an influence in the councils all the way over here in the East? Um, and that is because they're, they're, they're working out this, the, the necessity of the Petrine primacy uh, in order to establish a Catholicizing unity for those councils. 
Now, we see a big development um, when you've got p uh, political developments in in the empires that kind of split off the east from the west in the ninth century with the crowning of Charlemagne and the the Byzantine emperors in the east um, this sort of creates a, a cavity in between the east and the west on the political format in the west the bishop of Rome began to take on almost a secular king-like uh, role himself just because of how much financial and spiritual dis, uh, influence was was held in the Roman pontiff as the successor of St. Peter. And so when the Western powers grew, you know, Pepin and then Charles, Charlemagne, and um, th this all created a like a, a secularizing papal primacy in the in the in the West and in the East, they wanted to maintain the more of the uh, uh, it's called symphonia, where you know you've got the bishops and the emperor as the crown, um, and so these political developments ended up um, creating some organic uh, uh, new canons. For example, uh, the Roman pontiff, you know, certain funds should be should be uh, held at the Roman chancery because you know. The for, because Rome is responsible for manufacturing candles, like you see some of the things that would never come up in the third century, um, and all of a sudden Rome's occupying this central place. Well, these are organic, practical, gradual um, things that just you know enter into the the sphere of law. You know, when we get into the eleventh century, you've got canonical compilers like. Uh, Gratian and um, uh, just all kinds of uh, Franciscan lawyers. And you've got this whole theory of jurisprudence on how uh, the church should be governed. And the Roman pontiff comes up on a number of uh, scores that are just, it's just a natural development. Uh, in the East, that's, this is where they, this, you know, this is, they, they developed a, a sense that, the Roman pontiff was basically reorienting himself against the faith of the church. And so they thought it was just completely illegitimized, you know, or it became illegitimate at a certain point. So you have a, a, a it's, it's not an, it, you don't just go from St. Peter, the apostle to Pope Leo the ninth, you know, it, there's a long process of development and I would say it's organic. Some of it might have been extreme at certain points. But you definitely see the same substantial seed, which is that the, the, the basic structure of the church's government was the apostolate, which has the structure of head and members. The head of the apostles was Peter. The members were the other apostles. And the episcopate, through apostolic succession, retains that basic dynamic of head and members. Head being the successor of St. Peter, the members being the other episcopate, the other members of the Episcopal College. And so from, from St. Peter to St. Leo IX, that basic structure is retained. And, and there are no alternatives that retain that basic structure so we're left to trust we're, we're left to trust that the holy spirit um guided at least the majority of of what happened there otherwise we're we're, we're out of uh we've we've got nothing on the farm left right exactly <laughs> now i've been studying uh th this issue for a couple decades now uh eastern orthodoxy and the view of the papacy and then things like that and i kind of had gotten to the point where i came to conclusion that and a lot of people have, have come to this conclusion, and that is yes, there's development. You have your acorn of the apostolate, you have Peter's role, and you have the, this development. But there was almost like there was two developments. That there was a development in the West, and you you touched on this in your answer there. There's development in the East, where and at the point where even at the time of let's say the the um, time of Saint Leo the Great, uh, fifth century, that you already have an almost fundamental difference in understanding 
of what the papacy means between the the pope himself obviously the i think i think everybody agrees that the popes at least as, as far back as the time of leo had a certain self understanding that was right. very much in line with what later developed in the west but the but in the East, the development just was happening differently and almost through no fault of anybody. It wasn't like in the East, they're like, hey, let's go against the it's like they were they were modern day Eastern Orthodox trying to find anything wrong right. with the West. They simply had a different understanding. Yeah. However. And so in that sense, it's very hard to. Uh, it, it's very easy, I should say, to see the Eastern Orthodox, the modern Eastern Orthodox understanding of the papacy. Now, you push back up against that, though, in your book. And I thought that was great because you really do push back and say it's not quite as separate as people think. And, and, and the, the East didn't quite have this total conciliar attitude. Can you talk a little bit about that, how the East view of the papacy isn't that yeah. what, 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 frankly, the Eastern Orthodox today say it is? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 definitely true. Um, you know, I, I had to, um, you know, as a non PhD, right, I had to I had to submit to what the phds are seeing in the data which is that there's there does seem to be to a divergence you have kind of like two ecclesiologies that are developing in the east and the west um but uh, it, it, it's not as crisp as that you know I, at least from what what i'm reading and i i think that the scholars themselves recognize this is that um the east ended up really developing a sense of priority in the Byzantine emperor, you know, and in the West, you see this, this priority of the Roman pontiff as the successor of St. Peter, but they work together. I mean, even the popes recognize the, the authority of the Byzantine empire uh, and the, the, of the emperor in ecclesiastical affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, you I know, saw that when I'm reading about St. Gregory the Great. He yeah. definitely looked to the Byzantine emperor as as having a role at the very exactly. least, an authoritative role even in many cases. Yeah, and even a divinely or ordained one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but it had its it it had its reach, right? You know, it had its reach, and it was not going to compete with the Episcopal government, um, let alone the this the 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 government of the primacy. Of, of the apostolic see um but for just practical matters getting an ecumenical council together uh funding the bill for the bishops to lodge um and have enough food for whatever six months um these things were not uh these things were kind of seen as a providential hand of god through the secular state and and the secular state being uh, having bowed the knee to Jesus Christ, this was all seen as a uh, a provident an act of providence on the part of our Lord. So, um, but you, you do start to see the East um, where they they start to recognize that the final word um, is not so much with the Roman Pontiff as it is with um, either. You, you find all kinds of different epistemic frameworks like Nestorius, for example, you know, he, he came out and said, look, if, if the majority of the church is going to go one way, well, I'm going to go another way. So, well, that means that at some point in the catechetical formation of Nestorius, um, he was, he, he thought it was uh, possible to just take scripture and tradition in his own understanding and, and run in that way. Um, so you've got people who are quite willing to, to go off in almost like a, I don't want to say Protestant paradigm of authority because Nestorius was definitely a man who who relied on tradition, but uh, he, he's not he doesn't recognize any strict format for how it needs to be um, situated, and so in the East you do see this 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 sense where they're willing to do things without Rome, and if Rome frustrates the plans. They just won't go with it. They won't go along with it. Or if they really need Rome to do something, they'll sort of go along with the papal claims just to get something sealed. Um, but it's there's a question as to whether they really internally believed what was being claimed um, by the Roman pontiff at the time. So 
you, you do start to see these two divergences. But what I say in the book, and especially at the end of the book, is I say this, is that um, Rome never explicitly capitulated to a theory of Eastern ecclesiology, you know, where where the sense where the council was over the Pope or something like that. Um, now, the East, in many places, they practically held that the council was above the Pope, but the Pope would make sure that the documents didn't say that. It said the opposite. And it seems as though the Byzantines were quite, uh, they were quite all right. They were content to see that kind of language get put into the text of the council. Um, so what you, what you have here, I think, is an explicit acceptance of the papal claims, but you have a certain amount of activity that can't be denied that evidence is that they may not have internally believed that. Um, so you've got a little bit of a divergence there. And then uh, not to mention those pockets of time that they just thumb their nose at, at the Pope. And in those cases, in many, in many cases, they just didn't, they just didn't enjoy communion with, with St. Peter or his successor. Um, but anytime the church wanted to have an ecumenical council, it was usually a reunion effort to get back into communion with Rome, um, with the exception of, uh, uh, Nicaea and, and a couple others, but the, the main reunion councils were all, you know, Rome wrote a document, sent it to the East, made sure everybody read it, made sure that everybody signed it and, and was on board, you know? Um, so you, you see, you see this this difference in perspective, but what was on paper facing up on the table, I think, was always the Roman narrative of things. Um, that seems to be what's most explicit. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go in the weeds in, in this uh, interview, but I was very fascinated your discussion of the uh, Fifth Ecumenical Council of Constantinople and oh, yeah. the three chapters controversy, because I've been reading about that as well. And and just the idea of how much it was like, OK, because, I mean, you have a situation I'm I'm blanking on the name of the pope who who end up getting Vigilius Vigilius. Yeah. 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 Who ended up going to being taken to Constantinople and like the debates and acceptance. But I think people read that to understand, first of all, it. it something I've come to the conclusion that, that church history is very messy. Yes. <laughs> it's not quite as clean cut. And so that helps us. I think today when we're talking about like our own ecumenical council that we've most recently had is that, yeah, things get a little messy at times. Um, and, and you just had this situation where you have the Pope saying one thing, then another thing, but he's being forced to say this and he's being arrested. And then some, some people are saying, yeah, let's go along with the Pope now. Then when he changes, like, okay, let's not go. I mean, it yeah. just wasn't this, it wasn't like this beautiful, perfectly formed uh, way. No, of, of not at all. Following the Pope. And that council, that council in 553 on the three chapters controversy, um, I don't know any Orthodox scholar or Catholic scholar who would say that that was done in such a way that we would want to do things now. Right. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, the emperor was hiring and firing bishops left and right. That's not the kind of conciliar freedom that the Orthodox speak about today. Right. Um, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, it, you got to be careful because um, one of the things that we see some of our Catholic and Orthodox friends do that study history is they they go into history looking for what happened and if they could just find out what happened then they'll know what they need to believe well that you got to be careful because what happened is not necessarily good let alone what needs to be believed right. um so yeah some of those things need to be um cleansed with hindsight <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to admit that the Holy Spirit allows things to get messy sometimes. I mean, and that, and that's the fact. If we believe the Holy Spirit guides a church, and we do, then we have to also acknowledge that he, his his activity goes over centuries, over a very long period of time. So within a 20-year time, you pick a 20-year time period almost any time in the first millennium, you're going to find uh, you know certain messy things going on. But ultimately, and that's one of the, the conclusions in another book, uh, which you referenced on papal primacy. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, by Klaus. Sh Sh how do you pronounce it? Schatz. Schatz. Yeah. Schatz. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and I think he's a pretty liberal theologian. I think he was. And yeah. um, but yet that's almost his conclusion is like 
Yeah, you know, it, it didn't really, it wasn't like necessarily linear. It wasn't necessarily clean. It wasn't necessarily obvious. But in the end, the Pope always won. The Pope right. always got what he wanted in the sense of it was like uh, confirming the papal, uh, the pra papal priorities, the papal uh, power that he had. So, right. um, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to move on to, to I want to apply this. I mean, this could be a five hour conversation and I want it to be a five hour conversation, but it's not going to be a five hour conversation. So we will keep it. Uh, we'll keep it more limited. I want to now jump a little bit from the first William to today. First, mm -hmm. I want to address how do you hope that this book advances our relations with the Eastern Orthodox? I mean, I've, I've been on record that I'm not a fan at all of almost any of the church's ecumenical work, except for, I do believe with the Eastern Orthodox because there's an actual goal in mind. Whereas with mm -hmm. the Protestants, I've always said, what's the goal? I don't know. With the Orthodox, we know clearly what the goal is. How are you hoping that uh, a revisiting of the first millennium really helps us with our relationships with the Orthodox? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, the 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 genesis of this book it really goes back to my own spiritual journey. Uh, as an Anglican, um, you know, I was I felt very comfortable as an Anglican because I can go into history and sort of treat the fathers like a cafeteria, treat the councils like a cafeteria um, and take what I thought was of the essence of the faith versus what's not of the essence. Um, but after so much research, I just could it, it was weighing on my conscience. I said, no, there, this is not right. Um I have to join one of the apostolically conscious churches, you know, and that put me at the fork of the East and West. And so I, I had to do the research. And as an Anglican, I already had been familiar with a lot of the work of like, you know, the Anglicans that fought against the papal primacy in the 17th, 18th centuries. Those arguments were very good for me. So I wasn't going to be swayed by statements that say Peter's the head of the apostles or Rome's the head of the church. None of that was good enough because we all, the Anglicans all, I mean, it's in our documents. It, I'm not our, I say our, that's way many years ago, but it's in the documents of, of the Anglican divines that Rome was the head of the church for good, for goodness sake. So I, I needed something far more than that. Um, so what I, put into this book was basically my investigation on um, this competition between the Eastern claims, the Byzantine claims versus the, the claims of the, the, the Catholic church as to what was accepted um, by the first millennium church. And so the first thing I wanted was I wanted something for my kids to research or pick up from anyway, you know, depending on what direction they go, I pray they stay, in the Catholic church, but if this ever plagues them at some point, I want them to have a resource um, that their daddy put together um, so that they could pick up from. But with it, with saying that it goes to the whole world, the whole reading world, um, you know, at this point in time, um, people are definitely looking at their options outside of the Catholic church. That's just a fact. Mm -hmm. um, the things that are going on right now, um, definitely uh they called it the red pilling you know w w it, people are recognizing that a lot of the impetus of what brought them to the catholic church or what gave them confidence as a catholic um is is beginning to fall apart and so with that the natural consequence is all right well i don't want to be a protestant um i want to be historic i want to be rooted in the past i want to be traditional um, and that seems to be a growing development now, especially with, with the younger crowd, you know, from, you know, late teens all the way to 40s, people are starting to want tradition again. And the when you go when you go on YouTube and type in Eastern Orthodoxy, um, it's like heaven opens up, you know, it's, it's a glorious, it's a glorious scenery. And so the question is, all right, well, if if this is the route to go then let's 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 make a move you know and my goal was well hold on a second you don't want to just make a decision like that without knowing the sensitive spots of whether this is actually going to be supported by history scripture tradition and what the orthodox themselves consider authoritative the authoritative past 
Um, so as it, you know, if you're an engineer or if you're working, if you're on a committee um, overseeing some design of like a bridge or a design of a plane, um, and you realize the first design failed, you don't just automatically go to the second design that's in the docket of options. No, you learn from what you what from the mistakes of the first one, obviously, and you're, you're going to have to develop something that is going to be trustworthy before you even test it again. Well, if Catholicism is going to be tested by history, let alone the present circumstances, because that's what most people are doing right now. They're testing Catholicism based off of the present circumstances. Um, if you if you're going to test Catholicism off of its substance, which is the historic doctrinal biblical traditional uh, foundations, you also have to give that examination to the Orthodox too, um, despite what we see happening amidst their churches. Uh, they're obviously far more beautiful. Their, their liturgy is intact. Um, the spirituality in many ways is very compelling, very attractive. Um, but, you know, most uh, I'm not. I'm not going to attribute schism to the Orthodox today. I don't want to say that, but they they are technically objectively in schism. But I don't want to refer to them as schismatics. But all the schismatics in the first millennium retained that level of liturgical beauty. There was never a huge uproar about the liturgical abuse of the Donatists or the Novationists or the Arians or um, a lot. And in fact, in fact, the Donatists were far more strict in their lit liturgy. Um, and, and the Montanists were known for being very strict in their fasting and all these things. So that wasn't just an automatic identification. Okay, that's where we need to go. Because, you know, Tertullian, that's one of the reasons why Tertullian had the transition in his own life, was the priests in North Africa and the, both the Bishop of Rome started to become lackadaisical at the time. And that's one of the reasons that led Tertullian to... Um, reject the main hierarchy and to go for a more spiritualist version of the of the faith of christian faith and practice um so the 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 main thing to get from this book is um what did our ancestors believe in in the east and the west if they believed in the eastern orthodox primacy and the eastern orthodox doctrines i don't touch the filioque way i have another book on that um but if if that's the case, then then jackpot. You know, not only can we go enjoy the new beautiful liturgy, uh, but we could also rest it on um, antiquity that it's actually true. It's not just something we're enjoying in the flesh. It's something that's supported by the truth, objective truth. Um, but if it's more difficult than that, and if it gets to the point where we're going to have to ignore what our ancestors held in the first millennium just to get that good liturgy. Well, you're going to want to know, at least you want to, you want to be informed before you make that kind of decision. Um, so that's really how I think this is going to help Catholics today. Now, how it applies to um, how we as Catholics are to, to view what's going on with Pope Francis or what's been going on since uh, the second Vatican council um, that comes in another that, that that's another phase of thought because um, and, and this is where I, be, I begin to be a little bit more uncomfortable about it because I, I'm not a very comfortable Catholic. I'm a convinced Catholic, <laughs> but I'm not a very comfortable Catholic, but that's OK. I don't imagine that Jeremiah or Isaiah was a, a comfortable Israelite. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but um it does mean that for me anyway, and maybe this is what's going to, what the book will do for others is I know that there's no other Island to go to. If I want to be a seventh century Christian in the true church, I'm under the Roman pontiff, no matter where I'm at, whether that's Constantinople or in Rome. So if I want to go back to the roots, if I want to go back to tradition, it's not, it's not going to be the kind of atmosphere where I can just reject the papacy. So with that being said, that means that the work I'm going to do now has to be done within the fold of St. Peter's successor, 
who happens to be Jorge Bergoglio. And that comes with all kinds of challenges. And, and many of those challenges, um, you know, I, I've, I've been on record trying to do my best to explain them in a way that makes it not as bad. But we're all past those days, right? I mean, we're all past those days. Um, right now, we're we're just we're we're we've got our faces um, open to the reality of what's going on, and um, I think we're just waiting on a Red Sea moment. You know, a Red Sea moment that might come all at once, or it might come in a pro a progression. Um, but. It, the solution is not to leave the communion of the Roman pontiff or the successor of St. Peter. The solution is to do is whatever we can to recognize that, yes, there is, we have to remain in this communion, but we also learn from history that the Pope is not an absolutizing despot. Um, he also is, he, he also is obliged by certain things that all of us recognize by reason, you know, and this is one of the things that has kind of been obliterated in the last uh, 150, 200 years in certain theological spectrums about it, it, it's basically a new epistemology that if we, if, if we don't have the Pope saying something or supporting something, then we're in absolute darkness and blackness and an obscurity. And if we don't have the Pope saying it, then we are, we're out, we're out in the dark. And that's, that's nonsense. Um, as baptized Catholics, there are certain things that we know, and we can even say the Pope must do. Um, and we know that because we have the Holy Spirit. We have reason. I mean, we don't want to downplay the, the grandeur of the, of the gift of knowledge and wisdom that comes through the gift of confirmation. I mean, all these things are here. So, we, have, we just need to organize and sit down and, and realize, okay, there's certain things that we know the Pope can't do and, um, and, and work from there. And, you know, our conscience, our conscience is going to be formed from, you know, obviously the magisterium, um, but, but the magisterium also recognizes uh, many of the, 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 the foundations that I talk about in the book with regard to the limits of papal power. And so I, I think that's where a Catholic should uh, focus their attention now. And, um, and uh, you know, we don't need to have anxiety about it. I'm, I don't have any anxiety about it. I, I was on Matt Frad's show like a year ago saying this. I, I don't worry about it. You know, um, if, if the light comes next year that I was completely wrong about everything, um, I, my pulse won't increase at all. Right. You no, know, um, I've done what I can. And, and if the Lord wanted me to know something else, then I, I hope with my prayers, my sacrifices, my daily request that he would keep me from error, prevent me from falsehood, would actually take root and, and bear fruit. Yeah. And, I you know, it's funny because I think it was about a year ago, something I was I was getting anxious about it and just, you know, grace of the Holy Spirit probably. Uh, just allow me to, to come to where you are as well. It's just like, OK, I, I, I'm not going to worry about this on a level not that obviously there's not there's concern when souls are being lost we're yes, all concerned about right, that and so it's right. not that it's more a matter right. of the the fundamental like epistemological does this even all matter yeah. type of thing where do i uh, escape to right yeah. exactly and one thing I, I when you were talking about this it reminded me a little bit of newman that when he was exploring the arian crisis he was like basically decide realized the arians were like the protestants the semi-Aryans were like the Anglicans and the Catholics were like the Catholics. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that made him realize, oh, my gosh. And it's the same thing here where it's like when we're trying to compare our times to the first millennium, what do we see is what organization today keeps the even if we're uncomfortable with certain aspects of how they do it, which organization keeps that basic structure that we all know is the seed and that right. is the apostolic college so you have to have apostolic succession plus a head in that college and practically speaking there's only one institution that does it and that's the, the roman catholic church that's the one that does it so even if we might be uncomfortable with some of the language used even at an ecumenical council like vatican one or but and definitely the language used by popes in the 20th century we can still say but 
where else do we find that seed still in existence? And that's that's really the Catholic Church. And I think that also helps us to realize something you make very clear, which I really appreciate, is some apologists on both sides, both the Catholic and Orthodox side, want to make it like it's a slam dunk in the yeah. first millennium. Mm -hmm. That it's just, a, okay, it's so obvious only an idiot or a, an evil person could not see that this is clearly X position, either the Catholic or the Orthodox position. But I think if we're being honest, the whole reason there's still a debate today, a thousand over a thousand years later, is because it's not a slam dunk case. That there, like you, I think the case is persuasive and convincing that it's the Catholic position is the correct one. But it's understandable why so many people don't accept that because it's not this slam dunk case, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And and that's it, it. I think it helps to know that because. Um, even though we can achieve confidence in in the Catholic view, um, it's not going to be a cheap one, right? <laughs> because it, when you advertise Catholicism, um, like for for instance, in Amer Americans are you know American Protestants, you know, with a veneer of education on church history, um, they're readily conscious of Protestantism and Catholicism as the two basic uh, options. Um, you get a Catholic who's got a veneer of education. He thinks, well, it's it's Protestantism, Catholicism, and Orthodoxy. Um, but and then you get this idea: well, the Church was one and undivided for a thousand years, and you know, the, the, it, everything was clearly Catholic before the Great Schism. What that ends up doing is is uh, it, it ends up making you only work a little bit to learn about the the defense of your faith, and then when you go meet. Um, sit down with, uh, you know, an Eastern Orthodox uh, priest who knows history, who knows doctrine. Um, he's going to just tear down everything you've you've said. Um, and so I think by saying that it's not a slam dunk, that it requires a deeper investigation, um, you'll actually do the work to to get the confidence you need. Um, if that's you know, if it's on your heart to really discern the matter, um, I think you need to. There more work needs to be done, and uh, a lot of concessions need to be made. Some of those concessions being uncomfortable, um, and we have to learn why it, why it is that those are not um, fatal fatalistic concessions. Right. Um, um, and and the more I learn. Um, the, the more I learn, because I continue to learn, I'm reading my own book um, and I'm adding notes to things, <laughs> further things that I've learned about the same things I wrote about in here. Um, and I, as I continue to learn, I, I recognize that, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm confident in my views, um, but I'm glad I did this much exploration so that I, I can um, I can sympathize with right. with what others are reading when they go into history and, and see something else. Um, and from my discussions with a lot of Orthodox who remain convinced is they'll at least say, you know, Eric, um, yeah, I don't agree with you. I obviously I'm very happy as an Orthodox. I um, I've been here for so many years. My whole life is here. My career is here. My family's here. I'm not just going to leave. But I can tell you this, that, you know, I I respect the way you've handled this yeah, you have a good reason to believe what you believe. Um, and you know, that's, uh, that's good to hear, you know, and if the Lord who knows our hearts, who knows our thoughts, uh, wants me to change my mind about it, I, I pray that he would, but uh, I'm, I'm here where I'm at. And, right, right. uh, to cite Luther, that's, that, that's all I can do. My conscience, that's my, my, this is my conscience. I can do no other. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not sure if we should be quoting him for this. No, no, no. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one last thing I wanted to ask about the book and it's not all why you wrote the book. You might not even thought of it when you were writing a book or now, but I feel like in a lot of ways, this book also is a very good defense against the Seti Vicontinus temptation oh, yeah. because in, in essence, the SETI Vicontinus would say today that popes can't do X. People who are claiming to be pope is doing X. Therefore, he is not the pope. And I think what we see in the first century is popes do a lot of X. <laughs> right. A lot of these things that supposedly popes can't do, 
they're actually doing in the first millennium. And I think that is a way to open it up. It might be the initial response might be a little scandal, a little bit like, whoa, I didn't realize popes could do that. But I think ultimately it, it I think it hardens our understanding in a good way of like, no, popes can do some things that today we would think are outside, outside the bounds, but they actually happened. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that's true. Yeah. It's, it, uh, you know, um, the liturgical, I mean, there was liturgical diversity in the first millennium. We're not going to deny that, but there were times where um, bishops in Spain or bishops in Illyricum or bishops in Gaul wanted to do one thing. And, you know, the Pope will just go and reorganize the whole diocese. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and and at that point, you know, and, and there were resistances. You know, we see that we see, you know, papal resistance has a long history. Um, the resistance to the papacy is just as old as the papacy. And and we see how those ended in each case. Sometimes the pope gave way. Sometimes the pope didn't. And what I see most often, more, more than not, is that when the pope, you know, was settled on a matter, there was two options, either remain in communion or leave it. And we see that with, for example, the Council of Constantinople 553. The Western churches did not want to receive that council in Spain, in northern Italy, and it eventually came down to, look, guys, <laughs> you've got two, there's only two routes here, you know, either continue continue uh scuba diving in the waters that you are or come out and 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 play and be a team player i know it doesn't feel good you know but you know that's that's what i see and um i don't want to discount the work that's being done today um to to question things but um it gives you perspective yeah i mean it really is because there's a it's like in one sense we, i don't think we recognize that there's a spectrum of resistance to the pope in the sense that it's very easy to say if you like you you see some of the hyper papalists today will say if you disagree basically with anything the pope says you're a protestant they just throw that out there but there's a there if you look at history there is of course the extreme cases like a luther who initially is resisting on a very minor level but then as push comes to shove he he completely leaves okay there is that model clearly and there's other models in the first on this because we don't think this is consistent with scripture and tradition we don't think this is consistent with what we believe and what our reason tells us and it, it they don't leave the church and then ultimately it does get reconciled like you said there is a point there's always a point where rome finally just says this is the last word either take it or leave it and and some people take it and some people leave it and so we do always have to have in our own minds those of us like me who who are known to, to resist certain things Pope Francis does. Ultimately, when it comes to that take it or leave it moment, you have to take it. I mean, you, you just, I mean, that's what it means. Um, history right. tells us that. Uh, and it might be a very difficult pill to swallow, uh, but ultimately that's the way it goes. But there's this, there isn't just two positions of, okay, I'm a, I'm a Luther leaving, or I accept in every single word that comes out of the, the mouth of, of the current pontiff, whoever he may be, uh, there is some room in there to negotiate. And we, it's, it's dangerous at times. I mean, I, I think, I think all the positions are dangerous because hyper papal is dangerous. Or Protestant is dangerous, but also in the middle kind of there is, is dangerous as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And I think that, you know, some of the mythology that gets around the last 20 years of Catholic apologetics is that if you become Catholic, you're never going to have periods where you need to sit down at the dining room table with your wife and pray for guidance on how to do something or what, what to decide because everything's going to be decided for me because we have the Pope, right? right. Um, you know, as a Protestant, we, we had times where we ran into our room and, cried tears into our pillow, crying out for discernment and discretion. God, what must I do? But as a Catholic, we shouldn't have any of that, right? No. Right. <laughs> uh, Give me it, my encyclical with my morning paper, right? <laughs> right. So exactly. Yep. Um, and that that's that's kind of the expectation. And and uh, we need to learn how to be happy and content with uh, unanswered questions and with questions that we won't have an answer to perhaps even within our lifetime. 
Right. Right. And it, as a former Protestant, I, I know that process and I do, it is different, but it is, there are similarities as well. The, I remember trying to decide what I believed about baptism, regenerative baptism, things like that. And then I was just out in the, in the wild, just trying to figure out on my own. Whereas those issues, there's still issues today that I'm like trying to figure out, but they, they're not like, first of all, so broad, they don't touch necessarily on things like baptism, which, you know, obviously is so fundamental. Um, but there's still times where I'm just like, the church hasn't clearly spoken about this. Like right. I, one example for me is I've changed my opinion multiple times of whether or not a Pope can be deposed. I, I've, I have an article I, I put up in one period five years ago saying, nope, just can't happen. And I've since realized, no, I think it probably could happen. I don't know how, but I think right. it probably could happen. I think it has happened. So it's like, and I'm comfortable with the fact that I don't have a definitive answer to that. Somebody asked me, what do you think about that today? I give them an answer, but I'd admit I could be totally off base on this one. And I just kind of accept that ambiguity right now. And I think, but you're right, the Catholic apologists sometimes they can tend to think that we're not supposed to have that in our yeah. brains at any time as a Catholic. So, yeah, that's new. That would have been news to any of the Catholics during the conciliar debates in like the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, where you actually had Catholics in good standing that denied papal infallibility um, and those who supported it. And they could both serve at the altar. They could both commune. Um, right. So it, we're just in another phrase right now where there's something on there's opposite angles. And, uh, you know, we just yeah. we wait, wait and see what happens. Exactly. OK, I'm going to wrap it up here. I want to encourage everybody uh, to buy this book, The Papacy, Revisiting the Debate Between Catholics and Orthodox. It's from Emmaus Road Publishing, from the good folk at uh, St. Paul Center. Yes, it is big. I mean, look at that. That's thick. I don't feel like, I mean, I feel like I said, like I said, it's a page turner. I think it's very interesting. It's definitely, if nothing else, the reference, in my opinion, if you want to understand and, and have a reference on your bookshelf about the papacy, when you hear somebody say something, like sometimes you'll be, you'll see an online debate and Orthodox will say something about some debate from the fifth century, some of that. Well, you can just pick up this book, look it up and be like, okay, here's what actually was going on. You'll hear both sides of it very fairly. Um, and I just, I want to say something else. I think I've mentioned this to you privately before, but I'm just, I don't know if people realize how amazing it is that you got this book published. And I, I say know. this not as an insult, but as a compliment, no, because I you hear do you. not have any, you do not have any theological degrees to my knowledge, right? I mean, your undergrads no. in criminal justice, mm -hmm. right? You have a bachelor of science in criminal justice and a career in technology, which is, right. I was similar. I used to have a career in technology. I remember when I first tried to get my first book published was about a dozen years ago. I did not yet have my master's in theology and that alone closed so many doors until I had those letters MA after my name, publishers didn't even want to talk to me. And yet here you are with, you have no uh, advanced degree, correct? I mean, just, right. just a bachelor's in criminal justice. And yet you were able to get, I mean, I'm so I'm, I'm thankful for this. You were able to get this published. I just think that's, I mean, my opinion is like the work of the Holy Spirit that that made that happen because it, yeah. it's very difficult. I know how difficult it is to get something published of this nature, of this magnitude without having the proper letters after your name. So yeah. congratulations on that. I, 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 yeah, thank you so much. I, I think a lot of it had to do with, uh, um, you know, I stepped out onto the scene talking about these things at a, at a, at a deeper level than what most people were seeing and it's become such a dire necessity to know about this now. Right. Um, and, and not, not many people have taken the time to uh, study this and, uh, or I should say to write about it, right. you know? And um, so, yeah. And, and, you know, Scott Hahn is a very gracious man. He, I, I, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't, you know, him, James Merrick, and the good folks at uh, right. St. Paul Center, like you said, uh, if it wasn't for them and their uh, condescending grace, uh, yeah. yeah, would have never happened. I mean, that's the great thing about Scott. He doesn't have any errors. He, he you know, he doesn't care that, you, you know, I mean, he's a theologian of, of, of a top notch. He's got all the degrees and he hobnobs with all the people with all the degrees, but ultimately he doesn't care. It's like, if it's a good book, okay, that's yeah. good enough for me. So, yeah. okay. So I will put a link to the book in the show notes. Also, where else can people find out about the, the work you're doing? Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, my, I still, I still have my old, my old stomping grounds at, uh, ericibarra.org. Um, that's just my main blog. 
Um, you'll see me writing uh, articles there, uh, just doing, you know, spitballing, testing ideas. I mean, it's not really a place where um, I make sure I'm oh, 100% consistent from the articles I wrote five years ago. Um, it's just a place where I can generate discussion. Um, you could also go to ericibarra.com. Uh, I plan on having some new projects coming in the near future. Um, and then my YouTube channel, uh, Classical Christian Thought, um, which, you know, Michael Lofton, is, when he started Reason in Theology, I appeared on there quite a bit. I decided after a while to just start my own. Um, so that's called Classical Christian Thought. Okay, I'm going to put a link to all those in the show notes. Uh, I encourage people to go to them and to find out. I, I always like uh, when you put up a new blog post. Uh, it's always interesting. It's like, like you said, it's like you're spitballing, uh, but it's great because it, it yeah. gets us all kind of spitballing in our minds. Uh, yeah, and I, I I always get a very bad, scathing email about it, and then a really good one. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's what it means to be out there on the internet, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah. that, that's the nature of the beast. So, okay, Eric. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for writing this book. Encourage people to buy it. Check out all the stuff Eric's doing. Thank you. Okay, everybody, until next time, God love you. <laughs>